friends can watch it later. Um, provision four, uh, launch websites with as little effort as possible is, is the mission. Um, I don't know if you've installed Drupal before or looked at the installation documentation. It's very, very, very long. You can go to the quick install for beginners though. There's a quick install for beginners page, which is super simple and easy to read. Hey guys, is that, <laughs> that going to be shown on YouTube? It's a very good illustration. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's like it's a lot. This is like, that's the actual page if you printed it out. Um, there are a million ways to run Drupal now. It keeps getting more and more. There's my very scientific graph uh, of how many ways they're offering for you to run Drupal right now. Um, in 2007, the people doing Drupal at that time were like, this is really powerful stuff. I want to run Drupal hosting, and maybe we can use Drupal to do it. And so they created Bright Hosting Company, which was like first Drupal specific hosting service that we remember at least. And that their tool that they built to manage their customers ended up being open sourced and became this Agar thing, which is what this screenshot is. Um, it's quite old. It hasn't changed much in a long time. Uh, for many reasons we've been discussing all weekend. <laughs> so the Hostmaster piece is a Drupal distribution. Um, and these are, yeah, the actual dates of like the original commits. Uh, so it's really old, um, but again, it still works. So we keep using it. Um, hosting is, the, is a module, it's in a separate repo for some reason, not in the Hostmaster distribution. Actually, it's a good thing because DevShop doesn't use Hostmaster, but it does use the hosting modules. Um, provision is backend stuff which does all the actual work for writing templates and restarting services and whatnot. Again, all more than uh, more than 10 years old now. Hey, hey. awesome. Um, yeah, uh, 10 years, 10 and a half years of many, many, many commits. Uh, yeah, the first commit I found. <laughs> Initial import of provisioning framework. Uh, the git blame, <laughs> it's awesome, 10 years ago, uh, 9 years ago, 6 years ago. Um, so the way things worked back then, we got a bunch of Drush commands in 2007, and the way things work now is basically the same. Um, nothing is, not much has changed, because again, it, it still works. Um, so we're, I did this, this gigantic history graph. <laughs> We should probably put this up somewhere. Um, not going to go through all the details, of course, but the point is this problem has been chipped away at for many, many, many years. Many, many people have built things. I've had so many conversations where I'm talking to someone that built something to host a lot of sites, and they're like, it's very agar like <laughs> I hear that word like a lot, and I'm just kind of, it's interesting to me. And we all know, you know how we kind of look at things and decide whether or not we're going to use them. You know. Whatever, so essentially this is what, what they talked about yesterday in the Anchor session, kind of our plan. It doesn't really matter. Um, I'm working on this 4.x thing, so this might be the CLI for everything. That's kind of my idea. Um, Christopher is more working on like the whole next, the whole, uh, another completely different setup for in Drupal 8 uh, and Ansible and other things. And, you know, we'll really, we just have to see how all these things shake out. You know, we can't really say like where it's going to go until we start to get more closer to the completion. We've got a whole paparazzi thing going on here. <laughs> Sorry. It's fine. Continue. But I've never had two photographers in a, se <laughs> in a session. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's totally fine. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I'm not even thinking about like a 4.x Toastmaster right now. 3.x works great, and it has to, provision four might be swappable um, out for the drush commands if we do it right. Um, so three might just become four, but I'm just, I'm just not concerned with it yet because we've got so many other problems to, to do. Um, eventually, yeah, all these cool things we added separately should kind of come together and we can design a better user experience by bringing it all under one roof. I just want to say, go back one. Yeah. Uh, hosting Composer is now hosting deployed. I'm yeah, sure. I'll just, well, let's just pretend that means the patch that is already committed. So check that box off. Oh, okay. No, no, I just put, I'm not really referring to the module, I guess, because the module's not, not, need, not required. 
to get the composer stuff. Um, okay, so blah, blah, blah. This is all history stuff I don't really care about. I just want to show you how to use it. So there's just three primary goals I want to have. It's like it should be easy to use. It should be actually easy to develop. Uh, and there's plenty of other stuff that we should leverage to make, make this possible. Um, to, first off, how do we make it easy to use? Symphony Console is beautiful, um, simple. So we get like light years ahead in usability just by using that. Um, <clears throat> everything is interactive. So in provision 3.x and before, you could type in like save a, save a server, but you had to know every single option ahead of time and type it in one long line. And so you'd have to say like, and that's why nobody ever really did that, I don't think. They used the front end to do it. Um, but with console, it's very easy to make it interactive. So I have all the options, you can run it on the command line, but if it's not there, it asks, and it has a prompt, and you just type it in. Um, and you get things like lists, so you can pass it an array, and you just, it's autocomplete. You just hit P, and it says platform, and you hit enter. So it's super fast and easy to use. Um, you know, again, I'll, I'll do a little live live demo later. Um, tasks. So I've distilled it down into these these lines. This this actually goes away, um, but we have to do a little robo patch to get this to work. Essentially, it prints it out with a box, says what it's going to do, and then if it passes or fails, you get a very clear done in blank seconds. And then the error message is actually captured here and printed. Um, so again, easy to read, easy to parse. I'm trying to get rid of all like these extra logs because uh, like the target user or other is the developers themselves and the, and the systems people can run it verbose if they really want to, right? Uh, if you run it verbose, it outputs like everything. So you see the commands, you see the output of all these individual, uh, they're, I'm calling them tasks because they are robo tasks. They're essentially little PHP callables, but that leads right into easy to develop, right? So. Uh, the whole Agar context thing actually translated instantly to Symphony, object-oriented code. Um, it wasn't very hard to get started because it was our provisions already object-oriented. Um, how many people here have not used Agar yet? Fantastic. So I can speak in this level, and I'm not total. No, I, there's some understanding, so I don't have to go into those details. They used to be store all this in the Drush alias file, which is a real abuse of power. Um, <laughs> uh, now it's just a YAML file, which is really great. Um, easy to read, easy to edit, essentially the same properties um, in the Drush alias file. Uh, but we also kind of get this nesting thing, which is a little bit better. So instead of like, you know, you had a, H, all this stuff was just jammed into one thing, and then having a hierarchy is a little bit cleaner, easier to read. Um, properties. Again, there, this is kind of just directly translated from old Agar. Um, we actually, I left the hook option documentation, which isn't the best name, but it's how, how it works. So um, <clears throat> by using this kind of new pattern of programming, the option, the property itself, instead of putting it in like the drush command option thing, I was able to make this strange little property class so I can just have these methods say like this is the description, this is the should be the default value, whether it's required, how to, and then like a dynamic validate, um, which is awesome, it's a little callable. And so this actually like, if you put in, this, this that part calculates like the uh, relative val like directory. So I dynamically, this is what you see in the output from this code. So it says root, uh, the description, and then the default value is, uh, generated from the get CWD, and when I hit enter, it just checks is that did they put an absolute path if so, or a relative path, you know, put it after the current directory so you can just type in uh, the name of the directory you're in. So it's just like there's a little lot of little things to make it a more usable CLI. Um, this is the get URL property, and this is a cool demonstration because it actually validates that it can connect to the repo as it's asking you for the URL. So when you type in when it asks you for the get URL for your project, you type it in, you hit enter, it actually does the ping to see, is this really a URL, can I access it? And if it fails, it tells you, you cannot access, and it asks you again. So it does actually, it actually do a loop until you enter the right, uh, a valid get URL. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and this is like robo, so essentially task exec, essentially the same thing as shell exec, but it has these 
it's like a command builder. So you can ha pass the command and then add an argument and then tell it to be silent only if you didn't specify verbose. So that's pretty cool because the, this is robo. Um, it already has methods to like suppress output and do all these interesting things. And so by passing like our own options, we can just say if we hit dash V, it doesn't run it silently. And then if it's successful or not, and then just IO is like the same IO class that Drupal console and all the other tools use. So you get success light is a simple method that does check and then your text. So super easy to develop, results in super easy to use. Uh, services, same thing in Agar already. Again, object oriented code. It was super easy just to translate to Symfony. Um, the server context, you run verify on it. It simply looks up the server context for a verify server method. It then loads all of these different steps as arrays. All right? um, the task thing is also similar to the property. So I created a task class that simply stores start message, finish message, uh, success message, failure message, different things like that, which results in those checkboxes you saw, where it's like either check or X. Um, <clears throat> this can be either just a callable, like run this function, or it can just be a string, in which case it execs it. Um, it's basically flexible. So when you define like a new service class, we want to be able to make it easy to include the classes for patching MySQL, but let it be easy for someone to add the Kubernetes class or whatever other class to do X, Y, Z, even like ping Pampion's API if you want to, right? Uh, with this with this code, um, yeah. So this is what a web this is what a service class looks like. Um, it's just it's <laughs> like almost the same as Agar three, but just a little clear. So you can extend this and kind of just change the names, and that's how you got the abstractions with Nginx or or Apache. Um, look, an interface, a PHP interface. We don't have any of those in Angular 3. So I basically just define like a service needs a met needs methods for what to do when I'm verifying a site, what to do when I'm verifying a server, and a platform, um, which are like three different things. But the service will do different things based on what's what you're verifying. Um, and if you basically say my Apache class uses this interface, then it requires you to put these methods in. So it keeps your keeps everything a bit cleaner, a lot cleaner. Um, so Agar three and, and prior really just worked with native Apache, native MySQL, right? We've been trying to get it on things like Docker for a long time. I think provision four should just have a Docker built right in. It just extends the Apache class. So the same Apache template file that gets written for native will get written in Docker, except you then you wrap it with a Docker compose and run up. And so we're just maintaining that one template, whether it's in the container or out. Um, <clears throat> the service class has a method called Docker Compose Service, where you simply print out all the things that the Docker Compose would need for that particular web. This is for the web host. The other MySQL class has a different set of Docker Compose things. And basically, when you run provision verify on a server, it looks up all the services. If it's Docker, it compiles them all into a Docker Compose file, writes it, runs the command, and you get, you're running Docker servers. Um, which has is, is just been so great, like, because we're already storing all this stuff you need. We're storing the port, we're storing all these things uh, in here already, so it actually wasn't too hard to get, to get this working also. Um, yeah, the tasks, like I, I already described them, uh, so I don't really go into too much detail, but basically, this is like a robo, the robo task exec command is just a cl nice clean way to, to build a command and run it. Um, <clears throat> so this is just running git clone with the git URL and the root to the root. Okay, very simple. Um, if you are planning on helping to develop this, just remember the execute is expecting exit code. So one is bad, zero is good. Uh, but look, get exit code is a robo method simply returns the exit code of the task you just ran. So it's great. I, don't, I haven't had to write. I'm not doing shell execs. I'm doing a nice, clean pattern, right? Yeah, these are super short. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice, right? It's funny, you know, we've got trust command functions that are, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is what the Docker build one looks like. Um, so what is it doing, right? This, yeah, for example, Robo has Docker build methods already installed. So I, I'm, 
you could run the command directly, but they actually have a task docker build method that has a tag method that you can specify the container tag. The options go directly, get patched onto the command as options. So I'm pe I piece together, uh, we do, we can, this does do basically a build time, a verify time build uh, by passing the build arguments and, and using this Docker file, which is contained in provision itself. So I'm actually putting the Docker file right in provision for a repo. It's because dealing with a separate set of Docker files on a separate Git repo on Docker Hub, it's just got crazy because I'm like pushing and I'm waiting 10 minutes for a new thing and this way. Uh, this Docker file actually does very little. Um, there is an upstream that basically does the bulk of the work and this basically just, we can look at it, but it does a little bit on top. So every time you run provision up, it does a little mini build of another few layers to get the right user IDs. Getting into the weeds there very deeply. Um, so you put all this stuff together and, I was, and this is kind of what it ended up looking like. Um, it's much more fun when you're seeing it live. So I'll just skip forward. And again, I kind of already described the, the method, but basically you run provision verify, it looks up the class of the context, it runs, kicks off that verify method, and then looks up all the services, and then runs the verify methods on those. So you get like Apache verify, and then MySQL verify, and the context stores all the information, so all those services know where the site lives, what domain it should have, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yeah, this is like super abstract pseudocode almost. Write a file, run a command. Um, we should make it so we could just call like composer require, you know, agar slash OpenShift or whatever. And it just all of a sudden is aware of how to configure OpenShift or Kubernetes without you having to do much else. Uh, so yeah, the leverage others thing is mostly I'm referring to Robo. <laughs> um, I'm not necessarily talking about Kubernetes and stuff, but Robo is like taking over the world. Uh, like I said, it has all this stuff, robo.li, you can go look. Um, Docker tasks, remote tasks, it has SSH and rsync stuff already, so, like we can use that too. There's so much stuff it already has. Uh, NPM, Gulp, it has like helpers for freaking everything you can imagine in ops, it already has these little methods for. Uh, and, and they all just extend exec at the end. That's the kind of beautiful part. It's essentially down at the bottom, they're just building a command and running it. So these are helpful patterns, but essentially it is just all going down to the shell exec. And, but they made it so you can use it as a framework. Uh, so that's provision just totally includes Robo as a framework. The, they created, the Drush team basically created a consolidation organization on GitHub where they started putting all these components that they were building for Drush but were super useful for other things. So Robo is in there, there's a config component that's in there, uh, annotated command, all of outperform in there. That's all going into Drush, but it's also going into like Pantheon Terminus and like this Codeception thing, Acquia BLT, there's like, I actually checked, I did this presentation in January in New York, there was 184 dependents on this, on Robo, there's now 216. So like keeps going up and up. Uh, Joomla uses Robo. <laughs> True fact, they have a Joomla Robo thing uh, that they use for like, you, it has uh, commands for like bumping your version number. So like, I have a robo release command in DevShop where it walks me through the release process and asks me questions and then tells me to do things if I need to. So it's definitely should have something like that in Agar itself too, because I'm not sure, I've never done a release, but it's kind of half manual right now, right? Um, okay, yeah, this is the, the crucial stuff actually, future plan. So since it's a, it's a packagist package, Drupal 8 can require provision CLI directly in its composer, which means it gets loaded into the site, which means all the classes that are in provision can also be in the Drupal site. So we don't necessarily have to, we don't have to have separate classes for like the front end UI and the back end stuff. Or separate classes, yes, but not separate projects. Because we could actually include the same version of the provision libraries in the Drupal 8 site and the CLI. You know, so I imagine the provision slash CLI might break out into its own thing and then maybe just provision slash core or something. So that but if the front end is Drupal 7, then that doesn't really help. Future plans. Right. <laughs> Actually, no. Every Drupal 7 site can be built with Composer now. Okay. If you knew that. Packages.drupal.org slash 7. 
it's awesome. Same way as Drupal 8. Composer required, Drupal slash module name. Do it. It's so cool. Yeah, it works great. Yeah, I, I, I've got a number of sites on 7. Even some Drush projects that converted you from non composer. Yeah. So we can build a host patch to three with Composer. I don't know yet. I don't know if the distributions can use Composer JSON yet. I, am, I haven't looked into it. There's some dragons there still. Yeah, because you do have to have a make file, I think, for a distribution build still. I don't, I don't, I honestly don't know. Right. Clearly, that should be something they're targeting eventually. Distributions being like composer based. Does that anybody know? <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Theor I mean, you would think eventually that would be the plan to make distributions composer powered. But who knows? Maybe we need to do more. Um, anyway, yeah, if we include the library in Drupal 8, like you could run context save method right in the web request instead of passing it to a back end. Anchor works has this extra command at the front that says provision save, so it saves its metadata in a, in a file. That might be able to go away if, if the, we store the config files in a writable location for the Dr Drupal 8 site. Um, you just call provision save, the YAML file gets saved, provision CLI can point to that same config, and we no longer have to have the separation of uh, metadata, some of it in the Drupal site, some of it on the command line, in theory. Um, yeah, decouple everything, right? Um, I got a docs page. I bought a domain for five years. So, <laughs> serious? Yes, yes. It'll be like Apache too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm trying. It's not heavily documented yet. But this this page is pretty good because I want to make it as easy as possible to customize it without having to write a bunch of PHP code. Like Anger, you, it's, you really have to know PHP and do these all, all these crazy hooks to do much server config manipulation. But what I figured out is like, let's just dump files in the right place and look for them. So um, <clears throat> a .env file is in there, Docker Compose looks for that. So we put some things in .env, so when you run, we basically made it possible to have multiple Docker Compose files. We didn't. Docker Compose supports that. But you have to pass that as command line options unless you put it in .env. So by putting the list of Docker Compose files in .env, you can go to this directory and run Docker Compose and know it's including all the files and merging them all together. But that's a pure Docker Compose feature that you may not know about. You can pass multiple files in. Um, and so this way, we write Docker Compose provision. Oh, that's a screenshot. I tried to scroll. Um, yeah, the Docker Compose provision is the only one that's dynamic. So you can drop Docker Compose. You can drop your own Docker Compose YAML in there, and it'll just merge it all together when it runs up. Um, it's dot provision. Dot, yeah, I'm gonna go to this site. I don't remember what that one is. But yeah, like dot, drop a MySQL with that CNF, and we write a build that we modify the 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 Docker build to copy that file in. Same thing with PHP any. It's like if it's there, put it in. Why not? Um, if there's a Docker file there named this, use that to build it instead. You know, so very similar to um, Lagoon and whatnot. So it's that's basically what it does. Um, the conf file is dynamic, so we may have to organize this a little more because like some only a couple of these are dynamically generated, but the rest are manual. You can put them in there yourself. Um, but you know, oh, this is the cool. This is the cool part. Go away. Robo file. Uh, I'll, it's better if I do a, a live demo, but a, ro a robo file you c it has turns a PHP class into commands. So you just type robo, it looks at all the methods on your class and they all become commands. Uh, and so if there's a robo file in there, it'll actually bootstrap that and you can put custom commands in the server. And in provision, we'll be able to have those custom, those custom commands in. I'll show you, it's confusing. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I make an alias locally called Pro because it's just kind of cool. Called Pro. Um, Composer has a built-in like logo thing. It's pretty cool. Pro LS or Pro S status. Uh, real quick, if you've never used the Symphony console thing, you it has like automatic aliases. So if you call like Pro S, you know, try to figure out the command you're trying to run. And so if it's unique, it can be the shortest one, uh, the shortest one there is. So pro st is pro status. 
there's no content. So pro save server mask. So here's the defaults then. We want to walk people through it if we can. So we know no server, first name, default server master. I hit enter. I don't I didn't pass the option, so I don't care. So there's a property on there's a thing on the properties that you can say don't ask. Because I don't like I really don't want to I didn't want to ask the user five questions that the default is okay. <laughs> so they're just hitting enter every time because it was just confusing people. So it's like, these are all fine. If you needed to overwrite it, you can set the option yourself. Uh, there's the context class it's gonna save. I can just hit yes to save it. Add a service, yes. Which one? I want this part is still manual, but we should put in like service stack templates. So you could just say, you want lamp? And you hit yes, and it does all this for you, but for now, you can manually assign DB. We're going to say we want the Docker one. Uh, this is unfortunately still manual. And for whatever reason, Agar stores the database credentials in a full, a full, uh, was it DSM? Uh, oh yeah, I'm doing like that. Uh, this is a flag I had to add to get Docker to work, or the databases. Uh, DB port you can leave blank because if you put a port in, it'll expose it externally. You can leave it blank and the container, only the container can see it. So I'm just gonna leave it blank. Uh, it loops through because you want to leave multiple, so I'm gonna add another service. I'm gonna do the web server. Um, there's not actual Kubernetes, I dropped a class in there. Uh, as a test, all I did, it's all it's all <laughs> composer auto load, so I literally just dropped a class called Kubernetes Apache in there. It's like two, two, two lines. Yeah, that's it. So like the metadata for the service is right there. We can just give it, a, give it, it doesn't do anything. There's just an example. Um, Docker, that one I want on 80. Um, this one has to be, has to be w -W -W. Because again, this works natively on my Mac. So I actually could be demoing this using OS X Apache. <laughs> I actually got it to work like with native Apache, which was pretty cool. Um, I, like we've, we've been having this question all day. Like, do we just say just just use Docker and forget about everything? But then I really think about how, like, we have all these tiny computers all over the world. Like, it would be really cool just to be able to make the most out of these machines. So, like, I even have like a, a regular PHP run server class as a as a service provider instead of Apache. Because why not? Like you can run Drupal just with PHP CLI and like uh, SQL Lite. You don't even need full on S like MySQL. So why why not support that if we can get it running even like on a tiny Raspberry Pi or something? Uh, so anyway, I added all the services that I needed. So I'm gonna hit no. Then it says, what's next? Of course, you want to run provision verify? Yeah, why not? I can just hit enter because yes is the default. And this kicks off the provision verify command, which for Docker Compose, it writes the file. It actually did this, Docker Compose up. Actually, I'm not sure, we'll wait for it, but I don't, I think there's a, I tried this earlier and it didn't seem to actually start, but the second time I ran it, it worked. So I'm gonna do it verbose. These the, pictures should match. What? <laughs> I'm not talking to you. Oop, provision verify this time. So you can call pro-v, because uh, there's no other command that starts with v. Pro-verify, if I don't specify what context I want to verify, it'll ask, it'll show a list, and you can just say s or up and down. It's really easy, autocomplete. Enter. Yes, this one is correct. See how that last one took two, it ended in two seconds. I'm not sure why. I have to go figure that out. So it somehow successfully ended quickly, but this is doing a lot more. So we're just gonna let it build. I'll do a verbose one after that. So, check database connection worked. Check root database access. Check access to grant privileges. This is actually slower than MySQL. Like Docker actually slows some things down. <laughs> like an Apache graceful reload is almost instant. Docker reload is certainly not. But that stuff goes away with Kubernetes and all these other things. But Look, this worked. So that's just the server. Um, so pro status shows me up. Oh, there's server master. Which one do I want to see? 
there's all the information I put in there. If I do pro cd, change directory to the server config directory, that one was fun. So I don't want to remember where like my config directory is, so I can just call pro cd. I can call pro shell, but no, not yet. I can call pro, this is the robo, the awesome robo stuff. So if I, if I do specify the context, provision knows that it's, it's a Docker server, it gives, I, can, I got it to give us extra commands. So I can like call pro server master docker compose and it just passes directly to docker compose so I can say yes. So I don't have to go to the directory. I don't have to do many, many things. Um, what other commands do I have? D logs, just as a pass to docker compose logs follow. Mm -hmm. And then my favorite, Docker shell, which puts you directly into the web container um, as the Acre user. So that's fun. You don't have to do the whole Docker Compose exec bash, but you just call it shell, Docker shell. Um, okay, so where's the website? Let's, let's keep going. I made platforms not required. Sites now inherit platforms, so you go to add a site, and it, you, spe you can specify root and make file and all these other things. So I'm going to add a, add a new site. <clears throat> I bought the domain local.computer, and all subdomains and local.computer resolve to localhost. <laughs> so feel free to use that. Um, platform is now optional. Now I can say the root. I'm going to look. Oh, see, it noticed that I'm specifying a relative directory, figured out where I was, told me that's where I'm going to save it. Um, let's just do this. Is that, uh, oh, I almost remembered it. Checking Git remote, public, no problem, connected. Uh, make file, nope. Make working copy, nope. Document root is web, because it's the Drupal Composer project. Composer install command is the property that I added. So per site, you can say this is install dash dash dev or install whatever options. I hit enter, figures out the rest for me. Save site context, yes, to that file, sure. Now the services thing, this is a separate, so serve, on servers, it's a service provider. If on the platform or site, it's a service subscriber. So you associate it. So it's like, it knows what services this site needs. So it's then asking you which servers you want to put it on. Because it knows what servers have Apache. So I just say that, and don't, that's the same, that's the database one I use. So it actually knows HTTP, loops you through DB, HTTP. Um, this will be generated, it's not right now. So I put this, but it creates this database for you. Um, ready? Is it gonna work? Uh, so again, platform was not required, but optional. So if you added a platform, it would have root and get URL or make file. And if you don't, it'll just use the site. So cloned it. That was really fast. <laughs> Cloned it, looked for the files. Uh, preparing Drupal site configuration is the settings.php generation. Docker compose up. And great. Mounts denied. Aha, this is a Docker. This is my uh, local Docker. But this is a good example of a good user experience when things go wrong, right? So we put the X, we tell you that it failed and we print the output if it failed, right? So you can see what went wrong. Um, so something went wrong here. Can I start the service? Mounts denied. Yes, because this directory is not actually in my Docker for Mac <laughs> VM. Let's see here. 
I heard it was like a, another way to kind of boost performance. You can not share every file on your system to the Docker VM, but projects is, so I'm going to move it. So my Drupal, actually wait. Oh yeah, I can edit. No, it's in a branch. I have a provision context edit command now that opens Vim on the YAML file. <laughs> that one's really fun. So otherwise you really have to go into this config directory and go find the thing and then edit it. No, sites. So if I just change the root. Pro V on the site. It's going to clone it again to that other folder. And we'll see, will it let me use it as a volume mount now? Yep. Preparing site database, creating the database, the user with the password we provided, or will be generated manually or automatically once we get there. Checking, checking, checking. Done. So, what's happening? How do I actually get to the site? Pro status. My site, actually, yeah, it's the domain right here. Is it gonna work? I don't know. Nope. <laughs> Five, oh, that's right. It didn't actually run the Composer install. I've got the chicken and egg thing I'm trying to. Uh, it should, run, should have run the Composer install, but it didn't, so I'm just gonna do it manually. I think if I run provision verify a second time, it might. This isn't like my primary project right now because it's really going to take a lot of work to get <coughs> really, really done. Um, and I'm more, much more focused on like the tools that customers want, are paying for now. Although everyone wants this, they, you know, people don't love paying for infrastructure tools. Right? So there it is, token core. Um, so I don't think I have. Um, this is going to be an interesting thing we should start to look at leveraging. Um, Drupal Composer project has this script handler, which does the chmod and the site's default settings PHP setup. So if we come up, we might be able to come up with our own little script handler stuff and may, maybe put that in like a. Composer plugin as opposed to keeping it in provision, right? Which then makes much more sense if we're trying to host more than one, more than Drupal. If we have like just a little library that knows what to do to the files of the project as opposed to like putting that all in provision and trying to predict, we maybe set, make little separate things. So, anyway, did that fix our problem? Yes, waiting, loading. MacBook Air <laughs> on Docker. It's super slow, but it's coming. Choose language. So it's not kicking off the automatic install yet, um, but the database is there. The username is there. We're good to install. Yeah, it's. Uh, Wicked slow on uh, sometimes, but yeah. Notice, I mean, the domain points to that folder. I didn't do. I did very little manual, manual work here. Anyway, it's working. We, we know. We all know what this is like. Right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure. Are there any other pieces of this thing I should show? I think that's basically it. Um, that's this is like the groundwork for all the other tools, but it works. It works now. I mean, so. So, percentage-wise, how far do you think you are with placing the brush commands? That's very tricky. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, the There's phone, a lot of them. I mean, yeah, I know. But I mean, like, if you had a guess, I mean, how? How many? I don't even know how many commands there are. <laughs> okay. A lot of mine are used, Frank, because I use dev shops, so I'm doing git pull right. updates instead of migrate site stuff. 
Um, yeah, it's. I'm gonna get better questions like that. How much more work do you think it would be relative to what you've done to just using this stuff? Maybe that's a better question. I don't know. It may be possible in theory to include Drush 8 and use your existing, the existing Drush commands. Because we figured out the separation for Drupal 8 yesterday. So it may be possible to include the old stuff. I, I don't really want to do it, but there's so many. Right. And like, I, 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 you know, I don't. Both in there and, and yeah. <laughs> like I, I don't want to maintain all the big agar, all this agar multi-site stuff my, like uh, yeah. at all. That's not my jam. I'm into the dev shop thing. But like I know it needs to exist if you guys are going to use it. So we got to figure it. Out, we got to figure it out somehow. But frankly, like writing these new commands is like so fast in Symfony. I don't think it's going to take much. And it's a good opportunity to clean up all that stuff, but, I guess, but that, I mean, that's sort of the we have to we have to do a real analysis. We have yeah. to be do more. We have to do more scrum. We have to be more. Well, that's what I was wondering. It's not like you're, you're I don't the know. person that's looked at it the most. So yeah. Like, well, like, what do you think? You know. Um, it's a lot. You know, and all these plugins have their own little provision commands, so it's quite a lot. Well, what would be involved in making this a back end for shop If you're using a subset, right? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this, is back -end, this isn't the back end for shop yet, right? No, not yet, no. Right, but presumably that's where you're going. Yeah, well, and, and Acre is a provision. Like, all the commands are equivalent. No, no, I understand what yeah. you're saying. Instead of the entire set of things, right? yeah. Yeah, git pull, git checkout, uh, sync, database syncing. Hmm? Oh yeah, but that's that's super. I already have a dot provision YAML file, so you can put that in the site itself if you wanted to. Um, it's just yeah, kicking off the Drush site install, um, having a set. Git clone, or site clone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Back up. Yep. Yes. Well, so, so, no. So, restore. So, We're calling it restore. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if that's what you're doing. For the dev shop stuff, like how, like what percentage do you do that subset of things? Really, pretty high. Like it's all just get pull. Like it's just the get pull stuff is just a few more steps away, really. Okay. You know, because like yeah, all this extra stuff is not really, not really needed, um, and I think. That's a that's kind of a good approach, yeah, like because like, it's it's all packages, so we could have like multiple versions of provision. Where like this one just does basic development pipeline, this one does massive multi-site migrations, uh, and then kind of have a nice clean separation um, of. I'm really impressed with the how small the, those commands are. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. It's it's nice. Um, yeah. I mean, they, they, so one of the things I haven't done yet is to make it. Make it easy to do that, like an extra, adding extra libraries, uh, because we would likely want to distribute it as like a far file. But theoretically, you could do like Composer Global require to add extra libraries for extra commands. But I haven't really explored that yet. Um, so, sorry, just to follow up on what Colin was asking about, mm -hmm. or commenting on the, um, the provision for commands um, that we got there. Yeah. The, so the the robo things and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is what writes essentially the context mostly. Yeah. The save. Yep. Provision save writes the YAML files, the context, and then verify does the the ver. Writes no. the YAML too. The the well yeah. yeah. Well, Josh is too. Right? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Actually, an interesting thing was, is I wrote a little Drush, it's not an alias file, but it's dynamic, actually. So, oh wait, did I get this to work? Uh, no, this is something else. Holy crap. <laughs> uh, you can write a dynamic, I wrote, I wrote a dynamic Drush alias file that looks at the YAMLs and or uses nine. that to generate all the aliases for the sites. Or nine? Or Drush? Uh, no. Just, uh, just A for now. Well, I haven't even 
It should it should work fine with just nine. I mean, yeah, there, there's no hope. There's no way. But it's just PHP file, right? It's like yeah, aliases yeah. equals. So as long as you build an array called aliases. No, it's a YAML file now. There's nine. Oh, there is no PHP aliases. There's no aliases. <laughs> there's no hook in Dragon. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. There you go. I thought I was being clever by doing it dynamically. We could write the file too if we had to, like we're doing now. Um, we're, we're working on it because we need it dynamically. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's too bad. But I guess you know whatever. Writing another YAML file is not a huge, not a huge lift. Um, I think technically we're out of. We got four minutes left. Um, but let's keep keep. Keep talking. <laughs> um, yeah. So, are we down with this kind of architecture potentially for the CLI? If it I works. Mean, I, the, my intention for year five was to write a console one that basically looked at the classes on the front end and dynamically uh, built out commands based on the entities and the options for the like the fields that are attached and stuff. Mm -hmm. That was basically uh, that part. The intention there would be for, for that piece would be for the back end to be almost completely dynamic based on what on the front end. Yeah. So like very little being defined. We don't save stuff on the back end. Right. Right. We, we have a mm -hmm. database mm -hmm. and we're just going to use the database. There's not, there's, yeah. there's no endless mode there. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we could figure out a way to specify it to be, to be both maybe where like the schema or whatever for a site the properties are defined and like you could do this with I think doctrine or something like that like have the class define the schema and then just create can create the database from that and then essentially the YAML file could be the equivalent or some I, I don't know um, but that's exactly like a debate that will never end it's like where should we save this stuff <laughs> well, I mean, but I don't the problem is that we're saving it in two places right yeah Mm -hmm. We have import to try to get stuff from the back end back into the front end, mm -hmm. and we're ingesting uh, Drush output to populate the log and other back end Drush context to be able to update various values on the front end. And so there's, all the, where I'm coming from is just that the, the, the fundamental problem with context on the back end is that there's two places that we're storing the same data, and yeah. we are trying to make it the back end as the as the canonical one. Be able to be run headless and console didn't exist when we were doing it. Yeah. So. Well, that's why I think the, the future Agar Drupal 8 into, or, or 7 or whatever, like if the if the Drupal module can read the YAML files too and maybe not use the database or then maybe, you know, or at least whenever the database changes, like, no, we're always saving those files immediately instead of waiting for some back end task to save it, like a queued task. Just to run provision save is not necessary if we can just write that YAML file in the when you push the button on Dru in Drupal. Right, but if you're running the commands in the context of the front end site anyway, you can just access the database. Right, but we may not, that's why they did that eventually originally so was to make that not required. So, right, yeah, so you can right. run the drush the back end commands without actually bootstrapping this other Drupal site, right. just reading the, the files. Right. But, Anyway, <laughs> we're, we're bike shedding a little bit here, but. Where, where, where I'm coming from is that uh, short answer is no, because <laughs> we're going in a different direction with that. Well, for five. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm not saying no in terms of yeah. where three is going. I think this is a, is a good thing yeah. in terms of keeping most of the architecture um, with, you know, being with Drupal 7 as a front end. Um, I think there's, I can see some challenges potentially with being able to get with what the front end expects to be doing and to be getting back from the commands. So I think yeah. I, I wouldn't delay too much <coughs> maybe prototyping that so yeah. to ensure that you're not going too far down a path that, that um, uh, ends up creating more work for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what exactly that's going to look like. Yeah. I just know that there's a lot of like, the equivalent of hosting import that happens at the end of tasks to gather the data back, right? So Drush posts a bunch of stuff back to the front end. Yep. Um, but we've been talking about doing that in a different method for a long time, right? Yeah. So, so put a little, put some rest in there instead, and like provision itself could just have like a post 
task webhook or something, like a URL that it knows to send data to. Yeah, that's what we're doing in, in file. In, we have that and we have a Drupal input, that, like an eager input uh, Drupal console command. Yeah. That allows you to just dump data directly into it without even going through and bootstrapping content, right? Just from yeah. Drupal minimal Drupal console against the database. So cool. there's, there's a number of things. All I'm saying yeah. is that I think that there is quite a bit of work to, to, to go. I think it's very promising, right? Um, and it's, it's just a different approach than, than what Eager 5 is doing. That's where my head is doing recently. Yeah. So, have you got feedback from, from Herman on this stuff since? I know you did a demo a few months back. Yeah, I mean, they're all, he's he's excited, I guess. He's, yeah, all, I think, like, I think, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm thinking, like, this is great. Um, that's what I'm asking, like, well, what's, What's left? I mean, we could just stick it in HTTP, right? Like, right. That's that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, we might might be able to do that quickly. I I, I don't know yet. I'm more yeah okay. yeah, but I'm trying to grow and hire people to get make it happen. So, um, an interesting thing about logging is like we might be able to start. We should be able to start leveraging um, like monologue and these other things um, that have solved some of that logging stuff. So we might be able to leverage something like that. To more in a more generic way, like handle handle the, the output of these commands. What's monologue? Sorry. It's a peach. It's a packagist library for a Symphony library that helps deal with like Logs. logging, yeah, yeah, or just like the output of your console commands. So it has the methods needed to like pipe it to different places or something. Yeah. I haven't dug in too deep, um, yeah, but it's pretty cool. You have like all kinds of inputs, all kinds of outputs. And it's like PSR or something, right? So it's, it's like a standardized way to handle this stuff. So that would be nice if we weren't doing our own weird back, you know, dredge backend output. Yeah. Yeah, send your logs to files, sockets, some databases, various web services. So yeah, that's, this, is what, this is what I need. <laughs> you know, just compose a require and start, start working on it. Anyway, uh, that's time. Um, <laughs> Call pro dash v for a fun surprise. <laughs> I put a little lassie logo in there. Why not? <laughs> Thanks, everybody.